afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, this is Redberry Rio here, and welcome back to another Aerospace Dimensions video. If you're brand new to my series, I have done videos on modules one and two, so if you are looking for those videos, then you can check them out in the iCard, in the iCard or the description down below. In today's video, I'm going to be talking about chapters one and chapter two in the third module. 78% of the atmosphere is made up of nitrogen and then the other 21 percent is made up of oxygen and then a teeny weeny one percent counts for all the other gases in the atmosphere and that's pretty cool because we need the oxygen to breathe and just understanding the composition of the atmosphere is pretty cool so it contains gases like carbon dioxide argon and a bunch of other gases and elements that kind of make up what we breathe and what the earth is <laughs> um so I'm, I'm just going to talk a little bit about my memory device for memorizing each of the different parts of the atmosphere and i'm going to go into the four different layers that we will focus on which my my memory device is thermostat which can be a little bit confusing but i hope i can explain it in enough detail for you guys that it makes sense to you so it, from the furthest from the earth working our way in, I memorize it with thermostat. So the thermosphere is the furthest most one, and then the mesosphere, then the stratosphere, and then the troposphere. Sometimes I would get the two T's confused when I was younger, so I just remember troposphere, tropical, plants, people, everything, lots of stuff is down there. Okay, and then thermosphere is the furthest one out in the earth's atmosphere and so um thermostat it's got the therm part and then mesosphere stat you've got the s and then the t okay so that's just my quick memory device and we'll talk about each of the different parts of the atmosphere now so let's start with the troposphere the troposphere is about 20,000 feet above the poles and 55 to 60,000 feet above the the equator of the earth and it has basically everything important to earth or not everything important but the life most of the weather most of the clouds all the exciting stuff is basically going on in the troposphere um like most people aren't going outside of that and within this Part of the atmosphere there's something called lapse rate that we're we're going to talk about which is something that pilots use to calculate temperature so if you are trying to calculate how hot it is outside if you've gone up 2,000 feet you subtract two degrees celsius or you subtract 3.5 degrees fahrenheit for every 1,000 feet you go up so let's say that I am flying at 1,000 feet AGL or above ground level, and it is 20 degrees Celsius outside, and I'm planning on going up to 3,000 feet. What do you think will happen to the temperature? What, what is the temperature going to be? Well, I'm going up 2,000 feet, and since that's two times 1,000, I'm gonna multiply two degrees by two, and I'm gonna get four, and I'm gonna subtract four from 20 degrees Celsius. So that would be equal to 16 degrees Celsius. That's, that's just something called lapse rate. So now you know how to calculate lapse rate, and that's pretty cool. So after we have met the edge of the troposphere, we get to something called the tropopause, which is like the little boundary line between where the troposphere and the stratosphere are. And depending on the time of year, this, this just can vary. So let's talk about the stratosphere. The stratosphere goes from the, to the tropopause, like the, the edge, that boundary of the troposphere, and goes out to about 160,000 feet. And it actually increases in temperature from that closer point to the Earth to further away, from about negative 76 degrees Fahrenheit to negative 40. And not a lot flies out there but there's something called the u2 which has flown out there before and there are other aircraft that sometimes sometimes go through the space but generally speaking most stay in the troposphere 
So the next one is the mesosphere, and that goes from the edge of the stratosphere all the way out to about 280,000 feet, which is uh, going from 30 to 50 miles. And in this layer, the temperature increases at first, and then it decreases when we get to the top of it to about negative 130 degrees Fahrenheit which leads us to where space is. Um, NASA has defined space as 50 meters away from the Earth's surface, and this area is also known as the thermosphere. The thermosphere begins at 50 miles up and it extends to about 300 miles, and the temperature increases, and it, it can vary between 1,380 degrees Fahrenheit to 2,280 degrees Fahrenheit, which is super duper hot. Okay, and then there's the ozonosphere and the ionosphere. And those are just based off of the physical and chemical processes that are going on in the Earth's. The ozonosphere extends between 10 to 30 miles above the Earth's surface. And in this portion of the atmosphere, it actually creates this little bit of a boundary between the Earth and the Sun, which is because the molecules, the oxygen molecules, pick up a third atom, which it, it just creates that ozone layer, which shields us from like the radiation from the sun, such as ultraviolet and infrared radiation. And then there's the ionosphere, which is about 25 miles to 250 miles above, above ground level. And that's where the sun's radiation results in a loss or gain of electron for different atoms. And the, if, if you're familiar with the word ion, it's just where atoms lose or gain electrons, which make them more negatively or positively charged, which is why it's called the ionosphere. Okay, so let's talk about chapter two, which is talking about air circulation. And this chapter goes into a lot of depth about radiation, the rotation, and the revolution of Earth, how global winds work, and jet streams. So it might be a little bit overwhelming, but this is a general overview of the chapter. So let's go ahead and jump right into it. The process of the sun heating up through the earth is known as radiation, where the sun heats up the molecules and they, they vibrate and they, they pick up the heat. And most of the, most of the sun's heat is absorbed by like clouds or the atmosphere and different molecules in there. A lot of it is also absorbed by the surface. And over the course of the day, you can kind of see the impacts of radiation. So if you're familiar with something called thermals, thermals are where hot air rises from the, the radiation caused by the sun and it creates this uplift of air, which if you're using a glider or something, then it can actually like bump you up a little bit and give you additional altitude. Or if you're in a plane, this can also like create some instability or turbulence when you're in the plane, because it's like, oh, I'm trying to be pushed up. And that, that's just something that happens sometimes. Something that the book does cover is that about 50% of the radiation is absorbed by the surface and 50% is absorbed absorbed by things in the atmosphere. Okay, so let's talk about rotation and revolution. The revolution of the Earth around the sun is 365 days, five hours and 48 minutes. And then the axis of the Earth is 23.5 degrees. So at different points of the Earth's revolution around the sun, they are known as kind of different times of the year. So if we know summer solstice, that's normally around, well, June 21st or 22nd. And then we, we experience the summer solstice, which is the longest day of the year in the Northern Hemisphere. Then there's the winter solstice, which is like on the 21st or 22nd of December, where it is the longest night of the Northern Hemisphere, which means it's pointed away from the sun more in terms of its angle. And then there's also the spring and fall equinoxes, which fall on March 
21st and 22nd or September 22nd and 23rd where the days and nights are equal in length. So the Earth rotates in a counterclockwise direction and there is a deflection to the right of its intended path when there are winds and objects moving freely in the northern hemisphere. And this is called the Coriolis effect or force. The general circulation of air throughout the world is known as the global winds. Winds moving towards the equator are known as trade winds. And there's something called doldrums, which are kind of the, the calm airspace that has no steady surface winds. And that is typically where the converging trade winds come together, where they're heated and that's at the equator. So between 30 degrees and 60 degrees of latitude, there are things called prevailing westerlies which are winds moving toward the poles and they almost appear to be curving towards the east. So if you think of most of the weather movements, the prevailing westerlies cause the weather movements in the US and Canada. At 60 degrees latitude, the prevailing westerlies and polar easterlies produce an upward motion. And as a result, the air flows to the west and the air flows from the poles and is turned towards the west because of the Coriolis effect slash force. And then there's jet streams and they cross the US at about 30,000 to 35,000 feet and typically jets or like the ma well, major airlines try to take these jet streams so that they can follow the airflow and get faster flights in. So they're pretty fast, they're typically between 100 and 300 miles per hour Sometimes it can be as high as 450 miles an hour. So commercial and military pilots use the jet streams to keep in mind which direction they're flying and if they should avoid those or take them. So that's about everything in this video. If you have any questions for me, please feel free to leave them in the comments down below. Thank you so much for watching and that is all folks. Until next time, toodles.